Father, it's your Holy Spirit that we seek tonight. It's your word that we dig into, and we just invite you to speak to our hearts directly. We've been learning some things that challenge us, that, that challenge our previous perspective and our previous beliefs and views. But Lord, we don't want to hear theories and traditions and ideas that are not of your word. We want to hear from you. So I pray that as we break bread together, we once again dig for as for buried treasure and find those things you want us to find tonight. And we need the very thing you want us to glean tonight. We're searching for you, and you will you will give us enlightenment through your Holy Spirit and your word. And to that end we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I like that. Buried treasure. Buried treasure. Buried treasure. Yeah. Buried treasure. Dig for buried treasure, right? Okay, a question came in. Are we really getting, is every eye really going to see Jesus when he returns? Yeah. Yes. Okay? Well, I got a lot of yeses, but I dare you to try to show that to someone. Right? I dare you to try to show yeah. that. So what I'm going to do. Every time I'm going to ah, well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have us go to Revelation 1 7. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. We're going to go to three different scriptures tonight. Because oftentimes, you know, when Christians have beliefs, um, we don't really know how to lead somebody to that belief. And that's really what the study is about each night, is we actually learn how to bring someone to a point of understanding through Scripture. So Revelation 1, verse 7, I'm sorry, it's page 1174, 1174. 1174. And it says here in Revelation 1, verse 7, it says, Behold, he is coming with clouds. And what do we say clouds for? Angels. Angels. And how many eyes will see him? Every, Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. By the way, you might be wondering, how are the ones who pierced him going to be seeing him? Well, we're not going to tell you that tonight. You're going to have to go, and someday we'll actually share that very, very topic. Because people we'll ask that question, how is that going to happen? But it's also uh, that group. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 6. And this is another way to discover... This is going to be on page um, 1178. And we're going to start with verse 12. Now, now we're talking about the sixth seal of Revelation. Remember the book, Revelation means the revealing. It's the revealing of Jesus Christ, and who he is as a person, and the things that he has for us in his work. And don't forget, the book of Revelation is a mini Bible in itself. It's, it's just filled with scripture from the Old Testament. But look what it says in verse 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black, a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. By the way, we haven't studied this, but we're going to be studying this in depth in the future. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, and the fig, its fig tree drops its late face when it is shaken by the mighty wind. By the way, you ever hear of anybody seeking out the blood moons? Anybody have that? I remember I was probably about six, seven years ago, I was in southern Illinois, and I was taking my dog for a walk, and one of my neighbors, who was a Christian, was at the end of his drive and looking up at the blood moon, and I didn't know he was there. It freaked me out. So it was in the dark, but he was looking at the blood moon. So, you know, Christians are looking at the blood moon, so we're going to study that one out as well. Um, and then look at verse 14. Then the sky received as a scroll, and it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So here we are, and this is the very end. This is when Christ comes. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and the mountains. Now, how many, what percentage of the population does this? Everyone. So if, that, that, if, if, if they weren't seeing Jesus, why would they be doing that? Okay? And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand? So, now I want you to think about that. Jesus forever is bound to our, he's identifying with mankind forever in a glorified state. So he's not able to be everywhere all the time. But think about this. How many angels are going to be with him? Billions upon billions of angels. And who created light? Who, uh, how fast does light travel? 500 million. Okay. Fast. So you see how fast yeah. light goes? The one who made it can travel faster than light. Mm. Okay, we can travel faster than sound, which he also made, but he can travel faster than the light. He has to be bigger than the light he made, right? Yeah. 
So how, how fast does that mean he can travel around the world? Okay. So you might not see him at the same instant, but maybe pretty close, right? Mm -hmm. Faster than any of us go to, to uh, up to a satellite dish you back. Now, do you ever wonder why they're asking for the, the rocks and the mountains to fall on them? Why that? Hide us from the face of him. Why would you be hiding from the face of Jesus? Well, let's go to Psalm 97. Does, does anybody here um, wonder why is it? Did you hear me think it, or you heard somebody else say, "Why can't God be with us now? He's real. Why is He with us right now?" You ever wonder that? Uh, what page are we dealing with? Five seventy-three. Thank you. I get to music talking, and I can't. So we're going to start with verse three. Five seventy-three is the page number. Five seventy-three is this is Psalm. 97 verse 3 and onward. So this is if this is why God doesn't dwell with you today, because He loves you and cares about you. When He did come and dwell among us, He wrapped Himself in flesh so that we don't get consumed by the brightness of His being. But look what it says, verse 3. A fire goes where? Before Him and burns up His enemies round about. His lightnings light the world, the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord to the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness, and the people see his glory. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's why he's not hanging out with us today, because he'd rather see us live. And he gives us his Holy Spirit so he can dwell in everyone that loves him. But what we also see here, it, you know, if you think about this, why are they asking for the rocks rather than being in that presence with him? Um, do you remember when the Twin Towers got flown into? Do you remember what people started doing after a while when the fire was burning inside the building? They jumped out of the window. And you know why? I mean, they knew it was to their, to their death. But that seemed, if you ever wondered which one you would prefer, rather than burning up, they felt that was the best way to die. So that's the equivalent of letting the rocks fall on us hiding us from the fiery fury of his presence. Okay? Why everything got quiet? <laughs> so did I do it in two minutes? No. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? So anyway, well welcome back, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Welcome back to the Confidence in Jesus seminar, and I hope everybody here is having a really good time as far as yeah. Yeah. digging in the scripture. Amen. You know, this is exactly, I said this on night one, this is exactly what the Lord wants. He wants people to come together, dig into scripture. Your mic on? Yeah, I think it is. Oh yeah. It's on, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, you hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, okay, can you hear me now, right? So anyway, it's great that we're here together, that we're digging into Scripture, but I want to be really clear with something. As we're studying the Bible, I love sharing like, you know, these precious, beautiful truths that we have in God's Word. But I want to make sure that we recognize that we're not here just to share facts. Facts are very important. Don't get me wrong, because even the Bible says it's the will of the Father for us to understand different teachings and doctrines because they point to Jesus. But as we're learning these different doctrines, the whole purpose of this prophecy seminar is to draw closer to who? To Jesus. Because Jesus is a God of love. So again, yes, we're going to be sharing facts, but these facts, if they're not centered around Jesus Christ, they're pointless. So again, we want to continue to go deeper and deeper as far as like connecting with our Lord and our Creator. And again, I'm just so excited for that. So, again, just to, to remind people, uh, we have some awesome topics that we're going to be digging into in the very, very near future. Again, this is a little repetitive from the people that were here the first night, but we have a lot of new faces, and I want to make sure people are aware of what we're going to be covering. So, one phenomenal topic, you guys will have a big interest in this. Besides the Antichrist, everyone's really talking about that. That's going to be next Tuesday. That's going to be exciting. But we're also going to have a whole nother night on America in Bible prophecy. Now, brothers and sisters, nowhere in the Bible does it say America or does it say the United States. But remember how we learned that we need to allow the Bible to interpret itself and a lot of it is symbolic language? Doing that concept, you're going to see America has an enormous role for end-time prophecy. 
Very, very exciting. The other thing, too, is we're going to be talking about the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Now, again, I said this earlier on. Everybody today in the Christian community is focused on, what's the mark of the beast? What's the mark of the beast? But brothers and sisters, that should be a red flag. This is why. Because the, the mark of the beast, remember, for every truth that God has, Satan has a what? A counterfeit. Remember the, the bank analogy, one of the nights where like, uh, there was so much fraud going on in the nation that all the bankers got together and they studied the genuine. So when they saw the counterfeit, they would, they would recognize it like that. Right now, everyone is studying all the different counterfeits for the mark of the beast, when really what we need to be doing is studying what is the seal of God. Because once we know what the seal of God is according to Scripture, we'll recognize what the mark of the beast is so easily. So again, very, very powerful presentations. Those two will be coming after we um, you know, do the Antichrist system. And again, just so you guys know, I'm not going to tell you who or what the Antichrist is. We're going to allow the Bible to interpret itself. I'm going to ask you, it's that simple. It's so crystal clear. So, with that said, let's start, let's dig in. Tonight's uh, presentation is called Identity Crisis. And again, we need to put on our detective hats as we search scriptures tonight. Because what we're going to do, we're going to go a little bit deeper. Do you remember the second night where we were comparing uh, God's character of love to, to Satan's character? And we were putting them side by side, and it was like so easy to fall in love with Jesus compared to Satan himself. But today what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit deeper in understanding Satan's role up in heaven. What was his role before he fell? Because we already saw his motives. Remember, he wants worship. He wanted to exalt his throne. We're going to go to those scriptures in a little bit here. And he wanted to be ahead of the what in heaven? Do you remember? The church. So it's very important to understand what Satan's motives were in heaven. Because we know according to scripture, he's been what? Cast down. So if he has these particular motives up in heaven, you better believe he's going to bring those same motives down here to planet earth. So now we're going to go a little bit deeper. We want to understand what was Satan's role in heaven. Now, to some of you, you're like, well, how does this relate to prophecy? This is enormous. This is the foundation. If we don't get this, it's not going to be as easy to see and unlock what the prophecies of the future hold. So again, you know, we have to do a little bit of uh, digging. We have to, like I say, put on our detective hats. I think I said, you know, like, what does a good... Uh, football coach do. Remember we talked about this a couple of nights ago? They study their what? Their opponent. Why? Because it gives up a better chance to beat them. We as Christians have to apply that. We're not here to lift up Lucifer or Satan, but by understanding his character, his tendencies, that will help us for unlocking the deceptions that he's going to do in the future. Does that make sense? Alright, so as I've said before tonight, guess what? That was a really bad buckle sound. We're going to buckle up. There we go. Let's buckle up. So let's do this. We're going to go to some different books that we, that we haven't been into before. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, Ezekiel is in the Old Testament. You have the book of Psalms. Turn to the right. You're going to bump in Isaiah and Jeremiah. And then you'll run into Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. And that's page 830 and 831. 830 and 831. Again, it's right before the book of Daniel, which we spent a lot of time on the first night. So again, Ezekiel chapter 28, and once you're there, again, it's page 830 and 831. Say amen with your evangelistic voice. Amen. 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 All right, praise the Lord. I love those evangelistic voices. You know, we're doing this together. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick this up in verse 12, kind of halfway through verse 12. If you look on page 830 towards the bottom right, you can see in quotation marks where it says, you were the seal of perfection. We're going to start right there. Now this part of Ezekiel is describing Lucifer. Okay, Lucifer and Satan, just so you know, are the same being. Lucifer was his name up in heaven, but then he became Satan, or Satan, which means the adversary who opposes God. But it's the same being, okay? 
But watch this. So we're going to pick it up again, halfway through verse 12. Listen to this. It says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Who here has heard that, you know, Lucifer was, is beautiful, right? And full of wisdom. This is the scriptures that we get it from, okay? Let's continue in verse 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God. We know that's true because he used the serpent as a medium. Okay, so again, this is just describing Lucifer. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald and gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Now, I want to camp out here just for a quick second. I, I wish we could really dig into this, but I'll give you just a little bit of a taste. When it says the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, that word timbrels means tambourines, pipes is sounds. Have, have any of you heard that uh, Lucifer was known as being like the, the, the head of the choir, the head of the choir? Again, this is where it's coming from. So again, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. In other words, one of the purposes for Lucifer, and again, we're not going to dig too deep into this, but he was known, he was the, he was the orchestra of the heavenly host. So just think about something, and boy, I really wish we could get into this. If he was known for music up in the heavens, and now he came down to planet Earth, do you think he might use music as a vehicle or a tool to maybe draw people away from God? You better believe it, but unfortunately we're not going to cover that. But just think about it. Those same patterns, those same motives up in heaven, he's going to use down here. But here, now we're going to get into some fun stuff. Verse 14. You were, talking about Lucifer, the anointed cherub who covers. You were the anointed cherub who covers. We're going to see that same language in a minute. And we've got to figure out what does that mean. So, but let's continue. The next page. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now, I want to stop with verse 15 because as a pastor, I hear this question all the, all the time. Why would a God of love create Satan? Have any of you ever wondered that? But look at what scripture says in verse 15. It says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Lucifer, when he was created, was perfect. Remember, being love, God being a God of love, can't force. Now, how many by show of hands here are parents? When we have children, are we guaranteed that those children are going to be good? No, but we take a chance. Why? Because that's what love does. So when God created Lucifer, he was perfect. But according to verse 15, it says, Till iniquity was found in you. He was built or designed to be perfect. But he chose, because God's a God of love and he honors choices, he chose to become Satan. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we're clear that God didn't create the devil. He created a beautiful, perfect being who chose to rebel. But God, being a God of love, can't say, and I've done this analogy before, and I'll do it too, you must love me. He's not going to hold anybody hostage. He's going to give people the freedom of choice, even the angels. All right, so that word iniquity in verse 15, when you look it up in Strong's, it means to distort, uh, to distort morally. It also means unrighteousness. It means, it's another word for sin. And you're going to see that as we continue in verse 16. It says, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. So now we're seeing how sin is unrelated to iniquity. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, oh what? Covering cherub. Hmm. Whenever God says something twice, again, there's probably a reason for it. We really need to kind of dig into that because... He's called Lucifer, oh, covering cherub now, a couple of times. That must be important. And then again, so again, oh, covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for your sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they may gaze at you. 
All right, so what we're going to do now is we need to dig into this covering chair. This is really, really important. And I, I have to tell you, and again, I'm trying to be as sensitive as I can, but a majority of Christians, what we're going to be covering tonight, have no clue about this. This is not something that you hear from the pulpit often, but it's very, very important to understand Satan's role up in heaven. So let's go to Psalm chapter 99, a little to the left, right in the middle of the Bible. We're going to be on page 573. Psalm 99. 573, Psalm 99. And again, we're going to follow the counsel that we learned on night one. Whenever we study the Bible, line upon line, here a little, there a little, we allow all the scriptures from Old and the New Testament to come together, and that's how we have safety when we're studying the Bible. Does that make sense? All right, praise the Lord. So, all right, here we are. Psalm 99, verse 1. It says, The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the what? Cherubim. The cherubim. Now, let's just stop right there. God dwells between the cherubim, and we know that Lucifer was a what? A cherubim, an angel, right? So God and Satan right here, we can see, had a very close relationship at one point. You could actually say that Lucifer was his right-hand man. Like, they were, they were side by side together, that Lucifer himself had one of the most exalted positions out of all of the created angels that, could, that anyone could ever imagine, that he was working side by side with God. So now, let's go to Exodus chapter 25, that's the second book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 25, that's going to be page 75. So again, you have Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and then Exodus... Here's a good time, if you can, to put a bookmark here. What? Be put a bookmark right here on page 75. Because we're going to read something, then we're going to recognize that we need more information, so we got to go somewhere else in the Bible to get that information, and then we need to come right back here to apply it, so it tells us a, a story here. Alright, so Exodus chapter 25. Okay, that's page 75. Please um, have a bookmark or make sure your finger doesn't slip away on you. If <laughs> you're going to use your finger. All right, so verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to who? Moses. To Moses saying. So right now, Moses is having a conversation with God. We're going to drop down now to verse 8. And this is very, very powerful. In verse 8, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary. So God is telling Moses, make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. So one of the purposes of the sanctuary is so that God can what? Dwell with his people. He wants to hang out with us. He loves us, right? So again, verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. All we need to know right now, as they're building the sanctuary or the tabernacle, notice according to the word of God, two times it says that the sanctuary on earth is made after the pattern of something else. Did you guys see that? Mm -hmm. So what do you think we need to do right now? We've got to put on our detective hats. What is this pattern all about? So keep your hand here. Let's go to Hebrews in the New Testament. That's after all of the T's. Once you get past all the T's, then you're going to have Hebrews. We want to go to Hebrews chapter 9, which is page 1153. 1153. And we want to see what is this pattern. Brothers and sisters, we, we might learn something new right here. This is really, really cool. So again, Hebrews chapter 9. Page 1153, and we're going to pick it up in verse 24. Verse 24 happens to be on the lower right column in that last big paragraph. So again, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. All right, this is what it says. It says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. Now let me stop right there. Notice the word holy places is plural. When you study the sanctuary, we're not going to have too much time to do that right now, but in the Old Testament, 
when they were to do a sacrificial system, there were three parts to the sanctuary with the tabernacle. You had the courtyard, then you had the holy place, and then you had the what? The most holy place. So there's two holy places, the holy place and the most holy place. So watch this, knowing that, that there's two holy places, verse 24 might make a little bit more sense. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, another word for copies is pattern, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. I want to reemphasize this. I'm going to say this again. Notice in verse 24, the copy or the pattern of the Old Testament sanctuary is based on the heavenly sanctuary. Did you guys know that there's a heavenly sanctuary as well as an earthly sanctuary? Some people, a lot of people don't know that. Really, really important to understand that. So again, verse 24, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies or patterns of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So again, we know that there is a heavenly and an earthly sanctuary. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 25. Again, that's page 75. This is really important because now what we're going to do in Exodus chapter 25 is we're going to learn a little bit about the earthly sanctuary. What's the purpose of the earthly sanctuary? It's to be a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. So as we learn about the earthly sanctuary in the Old Testament, we're actually going to get clues to that about the heavenly sanctuary because it's made after its pattern. Okay, so watch this. I'm going to pick it up in verse 8 and 9 again. Exodus 25, verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. All right, so now let's skip over to verse 18. This is where it gets really exciting. Verse 18. It says, now this is again, God giving instruction to Moses. And you shall make two what? Cherubim of gold. Now, who's the old covering cherub? Lucifer. Lucifer, right? So watch this. <laughs> and you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. Let's stop right there. Do you remember Psalm 99 verse 1 where it says the Lord reigns in between the cherubim? Well, now this earthly sanctuary is a reflection of God's throne in heaven. So this is why this is so important. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, so again, verse 19. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. And again, those are two different angels. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of, of one piece with the mercy seat. Now, let's think about this. Again, this is allowing the Bible to interpret itself. If we learned in Psalm 99, verse 1, that God reigns in between the cherubim, and now we're seeing on the earthly sanctuary that there's two cherubim that are, that are kind of on each side of the mercy seat, what do you think the mercy seat represents? God's throne. God's throne. Does that make sense? And that makes real good sense because God is merciful. He's on the throne and he sits on the mercy seat, okay? So I know this is a little deep right now, but this is really, really important. Verse 20. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. Let's stop right there. The covering cherub stretches out their wings to cover the mercy seat or God's presence. Okay, let's just kind of keep, keep going here. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim. Which are on the ark of the testimony. About everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So here's the main point right now, and I'm going to show you an illustration on PowerPoint to really kind of bring this together. But right now, we know that the cherubims cover the mercy seat, and they cover the Ark of the Testimony. 
That's what we've gathered so far, okay? And again, I know this is kind of a little bit more, probably not as exciting as some of the other stuff, but just trust me, hang in there. This is really, really important. Amen. So again, we know that the covering cherubs, they cover the mercy seat, which is God's presence, and the ark of the testimony. So watch this right here up on the PowerPoint. Again, the purpose of the earthly sanctuary in the, in the Old Testament is so we could have a better understanding of God's plan of salvation and what God's heavenly throne is like. Now, right here, Lucifer is one of the covering cherubim. Okay, now see how both of their wings are kind of covering God's presence, but they're also covering, according to what we read, they're covering the Ark of the Testimony. So again, God dwells between the cherubim, and you can see God's presence is the glow right there. The mercy seat is the presence of God, the heavenly throne. And again, the wings of the cherubim are stretched out, covering the mercy seat and the ark of the testimony. So here's the main point that we just need to recognize right now. Because remember we read over and over, O covering cherub, O covering cherub. We know the cherubim cover the ark of the testimony. That's what that was just called in Exodus chapter 25. So to explain this, I gotta try to tell you a little bit of a story, because this will really hopefully be helpful. You're gonna learn something about me. Anybody here know what a uh, ornithology is or an ornithologist? I thought so. That's what I used to want to be back in the day. A bird, somebody that studies birds. I love ornithology. Love I love songbirds. I love going out in the wilderness and listening to God's organic natural radio. Listening to the birds. Absolutely love it. Now the reason why I share this, how many here have seen birds have like a nest with, with eggs in it and stuff like that? Everybody here? Now I'll never forget, you know, every year we get robins that come to our house, Phoebe's, all these different birds. But watch this, and I bet you can you can understand this illustration. Whenever you see the birds, like when you see the robin lays lay the eggs in the nest, you always see after a couple of days that they want to keep the eggs warm, right? But after a couple of days, their wings go like this. Like a robin's wings will go like this over the nest. Why? Somebody help me out. Why? What is the robin doing? <laughs> you said it, not me. That is Holy Spirit inspired. So think of this. If Lucifer was a covering cherubim, and he is, what he's doing is the cherubim protects the ark of the testimony. So that means whatever is inside the Ark of the Testimony has great value enough where God wants something or someone to protect it. Does that make sense? Does that bird analogy kind of bring things to life? So what we need to do is, again, we need to figure out what's in the Ark because whatever is inside of that Ark, in God's eyes, it has great value because a old covering chair protects the Ark of the Testimony. So that's what we need to figure out. This is so much fun. So what's in the ark? Because again, it has great value. Let's go to, we're still in Exodus chapter 25, page 75. And let's pick it up in verse 16. Exodus 25, verse 16. It says, and you shall put into the ark, this is what we're looking for because this has great value. You sh uh, and you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. Okay, so we've already learned that the testimony is inside of the, uh, the ark, but we still need to figure out what's the testimony. So again, God is not the author of what? Confusion. Confusion, right? That's 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. So we need to allow the Bible to interpret itself so we can have a better understanding. So turn to Exodus chapter 31. That's page 83. Because we're going to get the very last part. Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. Again, Exodus 31, verse 18. And let's figure out, what is this testimony? Here's some more information. And when he, referring to God, had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the what? Of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. Now, what do you guys think this is talking about in verse 18? The Ten Commandments. Now, it doesn't say the Ten Commandments, so we've got to be careful. I agree with you guys. It appears this is talking about the Ten Commandments. 
But let's make sure, because remember, God's not going to have just one scripture where we can guess or speculate. We want to study the Bible the way God has told us, line upon line, here a little, there a little, to get all this information. So turn the page to Exodus 34. Exodus 34, page 85. And we, without a doubt, are going to get this answer. If we want to figure out what's the testimony, we know it has great value because Lucifer is one of the covering cherubims that protects it. So verse 1, Exodus 34, verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone, there's that language again, like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Now, some people know the story that that's referring to the Ten Commandments. But watch this. Just turn the page. Let's make it crystal clear. Exodus chapter 34, verse 28. A little more than halfway down on the left hole. God makes this so clear. Again, verse 28. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant... The what? The Ten, the ten Commandments. Right? Then verse 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hands. Now it, it, it's clear. Now we know without a doubt it's the Ten Commandments. So again, let's think about this. Satan as a covering cherubim protected God's government. His government of love. Known as the Ten Commandments. That's why Satan is known as the light bearer. His responsibility in heaven was to share God's great news of, of, the, of the Ten Commandments as far as how to live. Because he, God, he, God wanted to make sure everybody lived in a peaceful environment. And that's why the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 14, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Think about this. He was the one that was protecting the integrity of God's government. He was the one promoting the law of God up in heaven. But now he's in full rebellion. And he wanted to create a different government, which we talked about. And we'll see those scriptures in a, in a little moment. His government is what? The government of sin, of selfishness. God's government is based on love due to others as you would want to be done to you. Satan's government is based on sin, which is selfishness. Do it. If it feels good, even at the expense of others, that is his government, okay? So again, Satan had the most exalted position in heaven, but he wasn't satisfied. And that's why they call it the mystery of iniquity. How did this even happen, Lucifer? You had the best position. You were God's right-hand man. You were working side by side with him, but it wasn't enough. Pride came in. Okay, so this is really, really important to understand. So we know we're talking about the Ten Commandments. They're written on two tablets of stone, according to what we just read, Exodus 31, verse 10. Now, this is really cool. Did you ever know why they're written on two tablets of stone? Did you know there's actually two parts to the Ten Commandments? The first four commandments deal with your personal relationship with God. You know, that you only worship one God, that, you know, you don't bow down to images, you don't... Uh, you know, misrepresent him or sing his name in vain, and you spend quality time with him. The first four commandments are all about our personal connection with God. But the last six commandments on the other Decalogue, or the other uh, tablet, if you will, has to do with our interaction with people. You know, like, again, we, we used this on a couple of nights ago. If, if I love Pastor Tom, I'm not going to kill him. You know, if I like Bernadette, I'm not going to steal from her. You know, those are the principles of love. So, Again, very, very important to understand, that's why there's two tablets of stone, because the first has to do with the interaction with God, the first four commandments, and then the last six commandments, your interaction with people. So let's go to Exodus chapter 20 while we're here. Exodus chapter 20, it's page 70 and 71. And this is the, this is the government, this is God's government of love that Lucifer was protecting up in heaven. We know them as the Ten Commandments. Again, the principles of love. So again, Exodus chapter 20, verse... We're going to pick it up right in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Commandment number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Verse eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Verse 12, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So again, this right here is what Lucifer's role in heaven was to protect. But again, something happened. Now this makes sense with the scripture that we looked at in the past. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14, and we're going to do a quick review from the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 14, it's a little after the book of Psalms. Isaiah 14, page 667. 667. Alright, this is going to be reviewed for some. This is very important for those who have come in recently. Isaiah chapter 14, we're going to pick it up in verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. And here's that question. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Again, the heavenly host are like, how did this happen? You had it all. You were God's right hand man. But as we study, look at verse 13. This is so important. We are now going to get an inside look at Lucifer's motives. Again, this is a little review for some of you, but verse 13, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Let me stop right there. Quick quiz from a couple of nights ago. Who sits on a throne? A king. A king, right? And a king has a? Kingdom. kingdom. And a kingdom has laws, rules, or regulations, right? So when Lucifer is saying, I want to exalt my throne above the stars of God, what he's saying is he wants to establish a new government over God's government. Yeah. This makes sense now with what we study because God's <laughs> government is the Ten Commandments. He was supposed to protect this, but Lucifer's like, you know what? I got a better government. It's called sin. We don't need to do this. Let's just do what we want. And that was how this whole war started up in heaven, okay? So again, verse 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne or my government above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now what word did I just repeat over and over or emphasize? I. And we said Satan has no type problem? And I problem. He's all about selfishness, okay? So very, very important to understand. So we know now by looking at these scriptures, Satan cannot stand God's Ten Commandments or his principles of love. Because if he did like God's government of love, why would he want to establish a new, uh, a new uh, government? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so we have to put on our thinking caps here. So, again, this is a little bit of review here. So what happened? Well, again, there was a quarrel up in heaven, and it said in Revelation, it says in Revelation 12, verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Now, again, we talked about this. This is kind of like an oxymoron. Like, I mean, war in heaven? <coughs> but we've already unlocked. Does anybody remember what that word war means? 
Politics. Politics. It means polemos when you study in Strong's. So this isn't a war of like bazookas and machine guns and stuff like that. But when it says then war broke out in heaven, this was a political debate. Whose government is better? God's government of love or Satan's government of selfishness? God of love. Okay, very, very important. So again, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon is, and his angels fought. So here's a question. Why did it? This is another question I get all the time. Why did God just destroy Lucifer up in heaven? When Lucifer came into this equation and he decided that he was going to challenge God's authority and his government, <coughs> why didn't God just like zap him like that, just in front of everybody? Have you ever? I bet some of you here have probably wondered that, right? I know I did for the longest time. But think about what would have happened if he did that. First of all, the angels would have been walking on eggshells because can you imagine if if Lucifer is making an accusation and God just kills him instantly, they're gonna be like, wow, this is a dictator. Don't don't disagree with God or he's gonna hurt you. And then what would have happened? Some of those angels might have had questions. What if Lucifer was actually correct? They would never know because God zap fried them. So this is this is what's so beautiful about God, and it's hard for us to understand. He, uh, he knew in his infinite wisdom he could just kill Lucifer. What he had to do is allow Satan's plan to manifest itself so people could see the difference between God's government and his own government so everybody involved could make an, an executive decision which one is better. Okay, this is really, really powerful. And here, you, you must remember this too. Satan actually had an advantage in heaven. And some of you might be like, what are you talking about? Think about this. We already went to the scripture. Uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 2. It says, God cannot what? Lie. Lie. Satan had an advantage in heaven because he could do two things. He could <coughs> listen truth. But he could also lie. And you have to remember, lying at the very beginning was a foreign thing. So when Lucifer started making accusations, the angels, a lot of them were starting to say, this is going to be true. Because they had never heard a lie before. This is a whole new foreign concept of evil, okay? So this is really fun. I decided to add this in tonight because we talked about this a couple of nights ago. Remember I said that we are actually the first reality TV show, like the planet Earth is? Do you remember we talked about that? We really are. We're going to go to that scripture tonight. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, <coughs> New Testament, chapter 4. That's going to be page 1101. 1101. 1 Corinthians, chapter 4. So remember, in God's infinite wisdom, He's allowing Satan to manifest His <coughs> government. This is where you and I are in a pickle. Where is He manifesting His government? <coughs> Here, on planet Earth. And we're caught up in the crossfire. But watch this according to verse 9. This is again, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. Verse 9, it says, For I think that God has displayed us. Listen to this language. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Does anybody know what that word spectacle means when you look it up in strong? Theater. Theater. So let's read that. Let's plug that in the equation. For we have been made a theater to the world, both to angels and men. <clears throat> so God knew that he needed to allow Satan to establish his government somewhere, so even the heavenly host could have a better understanding of how bad sin really is. And the last straw for the heavenly host is when they saw the, the demons and Satan himself murder Jesus on the cross. <laughs> It was clear. That's why Jesus says it is finished. Because the great controversy is over. We have seen whose government is better. Now, let's put the angels aside for a second. We happen to be caught in the crossfires between God's government and Satan's government. Let me ask you this. 
Which government is better? Is God's government of love better, where we do, where we treat people the way we want to treat others, or is Satan's government better, where we just do whatever we want, even at the expense of others? Which one's better? God. God's government, right? So even we, as human beings, can learn from from this experience that's <coughs> taking place here. So let's watch this here. Oh, I'm getting all excited now. <laughs> what powerful beings work under the devil's command? What do you guys think? Angels. angels. Now, what type of angels? Fallen angels. Fallen angels. angels. Now, watch this. How many of you have heard that one-third of the angels were deceived in heaven? Who here has heard of that? Which one of you, besides any pastors here, can show me the scriptures to make that a reality? We'll be right there. What was that? Ooh. Yeah. Amen. Who said that? You know I said, I said nice. Praise the Lord, man. You know, I don't care what your wife says about you. You are a good man. Praise the Lord. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. It's the last book of the Bible again. But this is so fun when we start to allow the Bible to interpret itself. So that's page 1182. Page 1182. We're in Revelation chapter 12. And let's look at verse 3. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. It says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon. Now, who's the dragon? We've already unlocked this. Satan, Satan himself. That's according to verse 9 in the same chapter. So again, verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them out to the earth. Wow. So the stars right here, based on what we're thinking, must represent angels, right? But do we want to assume or do we want to see that by the word of God? Let's see it by the word of God. So keep your hand here. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Again, that's going to be page... Somebody say it over there. Okay, so 1174. 1174, thank you. So Revelation chapter 1, and we're actually going to be on page 1175, because again, God tells us to allow the Bible to interpret itself. Very, very important. So verse 20, towards the very end, this is Jesus speaking. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand are the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the what? Angels. Angels of the what? Of the seven churches. So biblically speaking, when you see the word stars, it's referring to the angels. So now going back to Revelation chapter 12, we have biblical authority to now put in the equation that the angels are the stars. This is, Pastor Tony's not making this up. This isn't speculation. This is allowing the Bible to interpret itself. So again, verse 3. Revelation 12, verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail threw a third of the angels of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now, what's really cool, whose tail is it talking about? Satan's, Satan's tail, the dragon's tail, right? So this is where Satan deceived one third of the angels. But let me just for fun, for giggles, Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9 and learn a little bit more about this tale. Isaiah is in the Old Testament. Again, you've got Psalm. Then turn to the right and you're going to bump into Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. I think somebody already said the page. You got it. 662 is where we're going to be on the next page. That's why I do the page numbers. I need you guys to help me out. I'm slow up here. <laughs> All right, so Isaiah chapter 9. Now watch this in verse 15 because we're going to get more information. Verse 15, it says, The elder and honorable, he is the what? <coughs> the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the what? Tail. The tail. The prophet who teaches lies is the tail. So now, going back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, when it says his tail drew a third of the stars, how did he do it? Because Satan lied to the heavenly host, to the angels. <clears throat> he had an advantage in heaven. He could tell the truth, 
but he could also introduce error, and that's how he deceived one third of the angels. Isn't this really cool how, again, we're allowing the Bible to interpret itself? And as we've already said before, if Satan deceived one third of perfect angelic beings, how many people in a sinful nature can Satan deceive? And that's why God in love, because He's all about love, He's all about connecting with us, that's why He said before His coming in Matthew chapter 24, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, don't be deceived. So, speaking of those deceiving scriptures, I have them right up here. Uh, you can look at the PowerPoint. We know that Satan is the great deceiver. Now, we've seen this from scripture. Revelation chapter 12, 9, we've covered this. It says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives some of the world, no, no the whole world, or a majority of the world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. We covered this on, I believe, night one or night two. If Satan is deceiving a majority of the world, according to the word of God, let's think about this. That means by default, and this is where we really have to have a heart search, a majority of what people think, according to Scripture, is probably not accurate. Mm -hmm. I know that's a tough statement, but brothers and sisters, that is why it is so important that we allow the Bible to interpret itself, because God's already given us the formula. He's saying there's a great deception, just like as the days of Noah. How many people got in the boat? Eight people. The, a majority of the people thought they had it right. But they thought Noah was like a lunatic. Okay? But again, never follow the majority. Because I can tell you, history shows the majority have never been right. Think of Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They were in that civilization where they were told to bow down when the, when the music played. It's always the minority. Now, don't get scared. That minority is still a huge number. God has tons of people, and I know He has specifically called you at this time because this is so important that we're digging into the, these scriptures together. And looking at the PowerPoint, again, this is referring to, this is Matthew chapter 24. Remember the <coughs> disciples asked Jesus specifically, what's the sign of your coming before the end of the world? And I just quoted this. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders or miracles to deceive, if possible, even the elect. <coughs> Here's another one that we've looked at. He performs great signs. Again, what does great signs mean? Miracles. He performs great miracles so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those miracles which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. We talked about this. Here's the formula for part of Satan's strategy to deceive the world. He's going to use sight, and he's going to use miracles, which is going to deceive people. Sight, miracles, deception. Remember, sight, miracles, deception. What God is telling us right here is that at the end of days, it is very important that our faith isn't based on sight and vision, but it's based on what? Word the Word of God. On the Word of God. Why? Because we've already covered, and this is the King James Version, Revelation 16, 14. For they are the spirits of devils or demons working miracles. If our faith is based on vision and sight and miracles and not the Word of God, in love, brothers and sisters, I'm going to say we have a flimsy faith. Because it's got to be based on the Word of God. Because even the demons and the devils themselves can produce miracles. Which means in the future, we're going to have to test if that miracle is coming from God or if it's coming from the enemy. And I've already said this a couple of times. I will show you later on in, this pre in, in these presentations how to discern a true miracle from a false miracle. But I'm not going to tell you because I want you to keep coming back and I want you to see it with your own eyes. Don't take my word for it. I want, again, that's why we're using the Bibles. 
that's more important that we see it from the Word of God versus just being told by a friend. You know another reason why I like Bibles? I love Bibles. Because subliminally, when, when we're turning the page like this, do you know what we're really doing? We're opening up our heart to the Lord where He can speak to us. Amen. Okay? Again, this isn't a time to just go, like, find that preacher you love online or whatever. It's a time to dig into Scripture. Because what's happening right now, especially in prophecy, and I know I'm repeating myself a little bit, a lot of these doom and gloom prophecy uh, people out there, what they're doing is they're looking for, for any worldly event, and they're like, that's it. That's it. Like, they're trying to apply prophecy by their own way of thinking. That's got to be it. Do you know? Do you know? Okay, uh, first of all, oh, what's his name? Ronald Reagan. Many people thought he was Antichrist because his numbers add up to 666. Obama was the Antichrist. Some people think Trump is the Antichrist. Brothers and sisters, God says, I want to show you things that are going to happen in the future. So when you see those things happen, you will believe. He's already told us. We don't have to look at all these worldly events and try to find a way to apply it to our thinking. We have to allow the Bible to do the talking for us. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, this is great news. I'll never forget. Side note, now I'm going off script right now. This is good. <laughs> I'll never forget. I went to a church one time. My wife and I were, were searching. And I'm telling you right now, God has his people in every single church. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I've heard there's different denominations here. Praise the Lord. This is what God wants. Where we as Christians can come together and study the Bible together. Amen. What the enemy wants. Oh, you're of this faith? I'm going that way. Oh, you're that faith? I'm going this way. That is designed by the enemy. God says, you know what, my people, humble, humble yourselves, let's work together, let's reason together, and let's dig into the scriptures and see what God has to tell us, and he will tell us collectively as a body. Amen. This is a major blessing of what's taking place right now at this moment. So, whew, I need to tell <laughs> Alright, I want to show you a scripture we haven't gone to yet. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, we're going to, have to be on page 1188 because it's the tail end of the chapter. And because we're not going to be here for the next two days, the next day we're coming back is Friday, because I'm going to go visit my family in Maine. I can't wait to do that. That means I didn't tell you this, but we're doubling up tonight. Well, I'm just going to go All right, so Revelation, Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. Now, here is a new, very important point. On deception here. Verse 20. Revelation 19 verse 20. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet. I'm going to stop right there. Later on, you will tell me who the beast is and who the false prophet is. Because God is not the author of what? Confusion. Confusion, right? So then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who works signs or miracles in his presence. By which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. This scripture shows that miracles are going to cause people to be deceived in receiving the mark of the beast and worshipping the image of the beast. Would a God of love say, don't worship the beast or receive the mark of the beast and then not tell us what it is? No. Not, well, really? That's it? No way! He's a God of what? Love. And we've already studied that Jesus wants to show us what these things are so we will be prepared because He loves us so much. Amen. Let's never forget that God is a God of what? Love. Love, right? We studied this in the beginning. He's compassionate. That means He's empathetic. He understands the trials and the tribulations that we go through. The Bible says that God calls us friends. Which means he wants a personal relationship with each and every one of us here. Because think of who a friend is. It's somebody that you talk to. The Bible says that he has chosen us, that he lives in us, and he wants to bring healing into our lives, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Why? Because the enemy wants to hurt us mentally, physically, and spiritually. Okay? So again, very powerful. And again, here's, I just quoted it. Jesus says, and now I have told you, before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe.
So God right here, Jesus himself is saying, look, I want to show you what's going to happen in the future. So when you see it come to pass, when you see it happen in the future, you will believe, you will have confidence. And again, that's why this is called the Confidence in Jesus Seminar. Now, don't get too excited. But as we begin to wrap up, <laughs> as we begin to wrap up, we're going to go a little bit deeper with one of the questions that somebody brought up here a couple of nights ago. Remember one of the questions was, can the book of Revelation be trusted? Mm -hmm. And Pastor Tom did a phenomenal job kind of covering some points here. But we have to make sure, we've got to go a little bit deeper based on that question now, because <coughs> if we're not comfortable with the book of Revelation, then we're going to have a hard time wanting to believe what it says. Because all the prophecies for the end time are in the book of Revelation. And that's what dumbfounds me is with Christianity, where many people are saying, oh, you can't understand the book of Revelation. Don't worry about it. And we kind of made that joke. Who goes to the movies and then in the last 10 minutes is like, yeah, I've seen enough. I'm good. You know, like, you want to do the whole thing, right? I hope you guys want the whole thing. So go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, page 1174. We're going to go, I want to make sure nobody here is nervous about the book of Revelation as we begin to wrap up. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the revelation of what? Jesus. Of Jesus Christ. Now, we already covered this. What's the word revelation mean? Revealing. revealing. So the opening line in the book of Revelation is it's the revealing of Jesus Christ. Is that good news or bad news? Good. That is good news. Yes, the Antichrist is talked about in here. Yes, it talks about the dragon. Yes, it talks about the seven deadly plagues. But the purpose of the book of Revelation is to reveal Jesus to us. Now watch this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must what? Shortly take place. Again, God is saying he wants to show us what's going to happen in the future. That is really, really good news, right? Yeah. And this is what Pastor Tom brought out in verse 3. This is beautiful. What's the first Blessed. word in verse 3? The last. Blessed means in God's favor. Beautiful. Blessed means in God's favor. So watch this. It says, blessed is he who reads. What instrument on our face do we use to read? Our eyes, right? So that means blessed is he who searches the scriptures. And those who hear or embrace what they've learned, the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So there's a blessing for those who read, search the scriptures, hear, understand the scriptures, keep. This is what Ashley said a couple of nights ago, and apply what they've learned. Brothers and sisters, we're all on different learning curves right now. God's not expecting us to keep what we don't know. But as Ashley pointed out, as we're growing as Christians, and he shows us something in his word, God wants us to keep or apply it. Okay, because he, he's not satisfied or content with us just reaching a plateau. He wants to grow us, he wants to grow me, moment by moment, day by day. So, here's another thing. We're not going to go to, to the scripture for sake of time, but what's the opposite of blessed? Curse. Wow, I didn't say a thing. Man, you, the Holy Spirit is alive and well. That's, you find that biblically in the book of Deuteronomy. This is a really trick. This is a really neat trick I want to share with you. Whenever you see the word blessed in the Bible, put the word cursed there and do the opposite of what the scripture says. Watch this, because it gives you a bigger picture of what God's trying to say here. God says, blessed is he who reads, hears, and keeps the word of prophecy. That is the same as saying, cursed are those who do not read, who do not hear, and keep the words of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Do you see how Satan right now is getting in the mindset of Christianity, where a lot of Christians are saying, we don't need to understand the book of Revelation. Well, does God really want to curse us? No, no God's a God of love. But why would people be cursed if they're not reading, hearing, and keeping the prophecy? They'll be cursed because God, in the book of Revelation, exposes the blueprint of what the enemy's going to do in the future. And if we're not reading, we're going to be susceptible to being deceived. And there'll be a curse because of it. God's a God of love. He's doing everything he can to reach all of us, our hearts. But we have to study the scriptures. Plus, just the fact the word is blessed, 
Would God put a blessing on something that we can't understand? That makes no sense. Again, I'm going to say the line I said a couple of nights ago. McFly, McFly, hello. Like, come on. Now watch this. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, page 1190. 1190. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. This is Jesus speaking. It's in red ink. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed, that means it's in God's favor. Blessed is he who what? Keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Out of 66 books in the Bible, the book of Revelation is the only book with a blessing at the beginning and a blessing at the end of it. Yet a majority of Christians are saying, we can't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> red flag, brothers and sisters, red flag. Not only that, stay in chapter 22. Watch this in verse, let's pick it up in verse 8. Revelation chapter 22, verse 8. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of an angel who showed me these things. In verse 9, the angel's going to get upset because we're only to bow down to who? God. To God. Even the angel corrects, <laughs> corrects John's behavior. Watch this in verse 9. Then he, the angel, said to me, See that you do not do that. Again, you don't have to bow down to me. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he, the angel, said to me, verse 10, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. For the time is at hand. Let me ask you this question. According to scripture, if the book of Revelation isn't sealed, what's another word for sealed? Closed. That means it's open for interpretation. And that's why there's a blessing at the beginning and the end of it. Never allow anybody to tell you that we cannot understand the book of Revelation. When we dig into the Antichrist system, guess what book we're going to be in? The book of Revelation. But we got to remember, parts of the book of Revelation are signified according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, which means it's in signs and symbols. So we're going to have a blast. Remember that teaser for the people that were here? We started to see how the Bible was decoding itself. Oh, beautiful. So, facts to remember about tonight. Revelation points to Jesus. God wants to show us the future, to have confidence in Him. God also <laughs> wants to expose the blueprint of Satan's deceptions. And God can declare the end from the beginning, and that's why prophecy points to Jesus. Why is tonight's message called Identity Crisis? Because Satan wasn't content with his role in heaven. He had an identity crisis where the created one wanted to be the creator himself. He wanted to overtake Satan himself. And that's why, again, the, the heavenly hosts are like, how did this happen, Lucifer? How did this happen? So again, Satan had an identity crisis by not embracing the position that God had given him. Here's a little teaser. Remember the scripture, that, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Remember that scripture we've gone to a couple times? <clears throat> Think about this. If God had a lasting message for Noah's time, and the scripture says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Do you think God might have a lasting message for humanity before he returns? Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, you do not want to miss this coming Friday. We're going to see God has a specific message for God's last day people right before he returns. And it's found in the book that has a blessing at the beginning and the end of it. You've got to come back and check this out because it is so powerful. So, so important. And here's an honest question. And I say this in a sincere way. I want to be very careful how I'm coming across right now. But are a majority of our friends studying the book of Revelation? Christian friends? They're not. There's that lie of the doctrines of the devils. Remember the scripture says, we'll go to the scripture down the road where at the end of times it says they will not endorse sound doctrine. 
Being told not to read the book of Revelation is not sound doctrine. It reveals Jesus as a blessing at the beginning and the end of it. The book isn't sealed, it's open for interpretation. And you'll be cursed if you don't study it because you're going to be susceptible to the deceptions that enemy has. Mm. Deep stuff. <laughs> we are going to discover, we are going to discover on Friday what the very final war is going to be all about between God and Satan. Because remember, the very first war that started in heaven, again, it's a political war, that debate of whose government is better, is now been transpired or transferred down here to planet Earth. And we are caught right in the middle of it. So, I pray, are you guys sensing the importance of studying the Bible for yourself? Yes. Alright, praise the Lord. Is this fun, what we're doing? I hope so. I really hope so, because, no offense, this is kind of far away from home. If you're not having fun, that's, you know, that's going to be a lot to tell my wife, you know? You shouldn't laugh, Lucian. That's, that's, that's not It's always one sinner. Always, always. But doesn't studying Scripture become addictive? Yep. It really does. It really does become addictive. And again, I've said this before, I know without a doubt. Don't think this is by chance. God has personally called you, each and every one of you, to be here tonight. Because there is nothing more important than what we're covering right now. As I've said before, I promise almost done. I love you. I love you too, Donna. Was that Donna? Yes. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> do not forget, as we are exposing what the enemy is going to do in the future, who do you think is getting upset right now? I'm telling you, I've already had multiple people come to me, Lucian two times, and say, how dare you keep saying this? Because it's true. When seeing, he's agitated as far as what's going on right now. He's going to do whatever he can to not have you keep coming back. Your tires going to pop. Somebody might get sick. Something's going to happen. Your boss might ask you to work. Do not fall for the temptation. I have seen people who are really, really sick come into a presentation. Now, if you're throwing up in this blood, stay home. Yeah. But I have seen people come in to the building when we're exposing this stuff who are really sick. And once they took that first step of faith, and I, I'm not going to point anybody out, but I know the individual in this room that's already had several things like that kind of happen to him. Okay? It's happening. Okay? The enemy does not like what we're doing. So schedule going forward. We're going to take a two-day break, which means we're giving Satan a little bit of an opportunity to have some time to play around with you guys. Continue to pray. Ask for God's protection. Okay? We'll pray before we close. But again, the enemy's going to do whatever he can to prevent you from coming back. The schedule's going to be, for the next uh, couple of weeks, Friday nights, Saturday nights, Sunday nights, Tuesday nights. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Tuesdays. And we will be here next Tuesday. And we will be here next, next uh, a week from today is when we'll be doing the Antichrist. Because everyone wants to do that one. And I'm telling you, it's really cool. But we need this foundation first. Till we get I want to encourage you to do something. If you appreciate what we're doing, where the Bible is the sole authority here, brothers and sisters, we have empty chairs, and we have a lot of friends in this community. Invite somebody. Just say, come, check this out. Come and see. Check this out. Bring a friend with you, because the stuff that we're covering is so important, and the more people that see this, the better work the gospel is going to be before Jesus returns. Because right now, God is recruiting soldiers who will share these precious truths with the people around us. What a privilege that you and I live right now. We could have lived in the time of Babylon. We could have lived in the time of Medo-Persia. We could have lived in the time of Greece or Rome. But God has called each and every one of us to live in the last days before Jesus returns. Anybody here, I asked this question, Tyler, I know you are. Who here is a sports fan? Tyler is just like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Think about this. We are in the last two minutes of the game on planet Earth. Okay, we're in the last two minutes on planet Earth. And again, I'm not endorsing sports, but I'm saying this is a powerful analogy. We are in the final two minutes of planet Earth. And you know what? A coach will always put what players in at the end of the game? Yes. 
And he has called you to be living in this time. Amen. He's not, again, I'm not asking for you guys to be puffed up and arrogant, but God has called you to live in the final days because as we continue to unlock prophecy, we're going to see that His coming is sooner than a majority of people think. Very, very important, okay? So, come back, invite friends, and before we pray, I just want to say, how many of you here have an identity problem? We all do. Very good answer. We all do, but we must remember that we have been made in God's image. Amen. We are precious. He spoke the words and we came into existence and that's how much He loves us. Brothers and sisters, let's reflect on the beautiful God who created us that loves us so much. Why don't we stand together as we have a closing prayer and let's praise God for all that He does. Lucian, I'm going to call Young Love. I did it to 8 o'clock as you requested. <laughs> All right. Thumbs up. <laughs> let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you so much for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It is so powerful. And Lord, we're so grateful that these words are just popping out of the pages into our hearts where we know that you are speaking to each and every one of us directly. Lord, once again, I ask for protection for everybody here. James chapter 2, verse 19 says that the devils and the demons flee from your word. And I'm asking that they will flee from the people here, that you will send your angels with the flaming swords to protect each and every one of us, Lord, so we can continue to come together, dig into scripture to see what you have to tell us. Lord, I want to thank you so much for this group. I pray that we would all remain humble but excited that you are revealing these beautiful truths that draw us closer and closer to you. Lord, thank you for being a compassionate God, and we just want to praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.